My name is Jerry Mandel, and I have been working at Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, for the past 20 years on gene therapy. This is an exciting time using gene therapy to treat serious genetic disorders. Promising results have shown efficacy and safety for neuromuscular disease patients. The title for this review, Redefining Treatment in Neuromuscular Disease, is entirely appropriate. I've never had a conflict of interest or financial investment in any product that I've tested. Here are my disclosures. In consenting patients for gene therapy clinical trials, I have learned that many common questions are on the minds of families. These include the very basic issues that need further explanation. The first is how does gene therapy work to correct the disease? This is an important question for patients to understand. Next, where does the gene come from? It's hard for patients to appreciate that the gene is made in the laboratory. How does it get to the target tissue like muscle or nerve? The gene cannot help unless it gets to the right place. And is gene therapy safe and how can we be sure? Fortunately, we have overwhelming information to reassure families about the safety. And how many times does it have to be given? It's hard to believe that one-time treatment can be so beneficial. And finally, what if the gene stops working? This is an important question, and I'll discuss this as options in this presentation. In this section on approaches to gene therapy, we'll discuss the steps we take to bring gene therapy to the bedside. Three issues are preeminent. First, it is important at an early stage of conceptualization to target disease without known treatment. Secondly, we, we need safety and efficacy using an animal model that mimics the human disease. And the third point is about feasibility. This implies that the cost justifies the benefit. Gene therapy trials are expensive, and this means that the disease incidence justifies the, the expense. We need industry partners to pay for clinical trials that can cost as much as $10 million. And feasibility also means that the preclinical data in the laboratory predicts patient improvement and does not simply show that treatment keeps the disease on a plateau. The general principles of gene therapy are seen on this slide. The first step is delivery of the genetic material to correct the underlying gene defect. The modifier is then delivered to the nucleus of the cell. And the genetic material is designed to do one of three things, either replace the missing protein, reduce the harmful protein, or provide a substitute protein that can correct the defect. In the bottom panel, we see a more descriptive look at the way we correct the gene. There are four Key, key approaches to gene therapy. First, there is replacing the defective gene by gene transfer. Here we essentially ignore the defective gene and use a virus to transfer a replacement gene. Next, we add a gene that ignores the abnormal one. A new protein is produced and this provides a substitute or a surrogate to correct the defect. The third choice is to turn off the gene that produces a potentially toxic product. This is called RNA inhibition. The fourth mechanism is one that you've all heard about and is called CRISPR-Cas9. This corrects the gene at its source in the genome. And when it is done, it is a permanent 
and very powerful way to correct the gene. I like to review the milestones for gene therapy to point out just how recently innovation was introduced into medical practice. It wasn't until 1970 that the gene was first introduced into humans. This initial effort had very little clinical impact. It was not until 1990 that the FDA approved the first gene therapy clinical trial. And this was for adenosine deaminase severe combined immunodeficiency disease, the bubble boys. My own involvement in gene therapy began in 1999 for LGMD or limb girdle dystrophy, but the trial was stopped before completion because it was the same year that Jesse Gelsinger died from gene therapy. The Jesse Gelsinger death was caused by an, an immune response to adenovirus. And let me make it clear that adenovirus is not adeno-associated virus. In 2002, another attempt was made to correct severe combined immunodeficiency disease using retrovirus. There was some success, but off-target effects related to insertional mutagenesis resulted in patients developing leukemia. By 2002, the players for gene transfer for single disorders changed dramatically to AAV. That became the main tool for gene transfer, leading us down a road for successful gene therapy and facilitating the program that I began in 2004 at Nationwide Children's Hospital. In 2017, the FDA approved the first AAV gene therapy for retinal disease. This was delivered by direct injection into the eye. That same year, we reported success in treating SMA by systemic delivery using AAV. And in 2019, this was approved for clinical use, meaning we could infuse the gene into the circulation at very high dose and achieve efficacy and safety. Let's take a closer look at the viruses that have been used for gene transfer. There are four viruses that are considered for different conditions. Retroviruses have a large packaging capacity that can transfer genes of relatively large size. Because they integrate into the human genome, they're used mainly to treat cancer. Next, lentivirus is a type of retrovirus that integrates with one major advantage since it can transfer genes to post-mitotic cells like muscle or nerve, but integration is its limitation. It has been approved to treat lymphoblastic leukemia. Next is adenovirus. Its size allows transfer for nearly all size genes, but since the death of Jesse Gelsinger in 1990, it is used mainly for treatment of cancer. And finally, adeno-associated virus is our best friend for single gene disorders. It is limited by the size of the gene it can hold. It has been approved for SMA and hopefully approval for DMD is just around the corner. Now we can take a closer look at the characteristics of adeno-associated virus. First, AAV transduces very efficiently, meaning it will easily enter the target of choice. It is safe with minimal adverse events. Its tropism is spe uh, hits specific targets depending on the AAV serotype. It is versatile and can be used to inject locally or through the circulation. And it is durable in that we have data now in our human trials that will continue to express for many years after gene delivery. On the bottom half of the slide, we have a picture of what the gene looks like. In the middle is the actual DNA of the gene in blue. On the left, we have a promoter. All genes 
natural or laboratory constructed must have a start site for transcription. For SMA, we add an intron depicted in green and an enhancer in red that enables the gene to work more effectively. At both ends are the ITRs. These are res residual contributions of AAV that hold the gene in place as it reaches the target tissue. This is an overview of the diseases that are long-term targets of the MDA. On the left is ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease and Friedreich's ataxia. Gene therapy is still in preclinical laboratory development for these conditions. In the center is limb girdle dystrophy and, and gene therapy is underway here in pilot and proof of principle phase one and phase two trials. And finally, DMD is farther advanced. Its success has now been shown for out to two years and it is in phase two and soon to be in phase three trials. This slide is of interest because it addresses the critical question of the persistence of gene therapy and the potential for one-time treatment. In humans, gene therapy for Parkinson's disease has persisted for eight to 10 years. In SMA, our own studies have demonstrated continued efficacy for five to six years post-gene transfer. And in DMD, we have continued efficacy and improved milestones for two years. These findings show that AAV is an enormously powerful tool for gene transfer, likely to persist for many years. Now let's look on the patient side of the gene therapy journey. First, when a family finds out about the disease affecting their child, they talk to their doctor about the next step or search the internet for possible treatment. Upon identifying a site conducting a clinical trial, the patient must be screened for eligibility. If eligible, the patient enters the trial and receives one-time gene delivery. The patient will be required to stay at that site for, the, for some time uh, determined by the protocol. As the trial extends beyond that time, the long-term benefit is determined by required visits over as long as a five-year period. Now let's look further into the details of the clinical trial. When a subject enrolls in a clinical trial, there's a history taken and screening blood tests determine is, if there's evidence of kidney disease, diabetes, or liver disease. Blood tests are screened for elevated creatinine and blood glucose. Liver disease is excluded by blood tests for ALT, ASG, AST, GGT, or GLDH. Blood counts also exclude patients with low platelet counts because platelets can be further lowered post-gene delivery. Another screening tool of importance is the blood test for pre-existing antibodies to AAV. Antibodies, if present, mean there has been prior exposure, and this will exclude a patient from participating in the gene therapy trial. The blood test to determine these antibodies levels can take a few days before results are available. The question then becomes, if there is a positive antibody test, is there anything that can be done about it? Several choices exist, but none have been tried in SMA or in muscular dystrophy. The choices are as follows. Remove the antibody by filtering the blood, a procedure called apheresis. If positive, there's a potential to switch to another AAV serotype. 
There is also an enzyme that is beginning to be used called endopeptidase. It can reduce AAV antibody levels in the blood and allow for gene expression. Some re researchers have used a cocktail of immunosuppressant drugs to reduce antibody levels. Drugs like rituximab and cyclosporin have been recommended, but the greater risks of side effects like those encountered in chemotherapy have to be considered. Finally, a major switch to a different delivery tool can be used, switching from AAV to non-viral nanoparticles for gene transfer. Now, let's look at the actual day of gene transfer. There is often a big buildup with nervousness related to the day of gene delivery, but it turns out this is usually a day with very few problems. Patients have IVs in both arms during the procedure that takes about an hour and a half to complete. Monitoring takes place throughout gene delivery that takes about um, an hour and a half, as I said, and includes continuous monitoring of heart rate, blood pressure, and EKG. In over 100 gene transfers, we have never seen a significant adverse event on the day of gene therapy. The most common adverse event we see post-gene delivery is elevated liver enzymes. ALT is the most sensitive biomarker for liver inflammation. And we also have AST, ALT, GGT, and GLDH to alert us to liver toxicity. We do blood tests checking for low platelet counts. And additional monitoring includes checking for heart involvement by troponin levels, creatinine for kidney damage, and monitoring for complement and immune activation of T cells. The single most important measure of efficacy relies on our physical therapist. Here, Linda Lowe's head of our physical therapy team is measuring the time to get up from the floor. On the left, we see a patient who is rising from the floor using his hands before he is treated with gene therapy. And on the right, we see 90 days post-gene delivery, and we see the patient getting up with ease without using his arms. Here we see a, DM, a DMD or Duchenne dystrophy boy on the left two days post-gene delivery before there's a chance for the gene to work effectively. And we see him climbing stairs, but notice he's not using, he's not going up one after another. He's using, he's not using reciprocal stairs. He's using one at a time in the majority of the steps that he takes. But as soon as, nine, as 60 days post-gene delivery, he is running to the stairs and going up beautifully reciprocally on a rather fast pace until he gets all the way up the stairs, showing that we have efficacy at this point in the trial. Here we see in an SMA child, she is able to sit independently by 12 months of age. And 14 months after gene delivery, she's able to cruise and shortly after that is actually able to walk independently. The take home messages from this presentation are that clinicians are critical in the path to gene therapy and they guide families and caregivers regarding potential efficacy and safety upon gene delivery. Next, one time gene therapy has the potential to transform patient and caregiver long-term quality of life and may reduce the burden of neuromuscular diseases on patients, families, and the healthcare systems. And AAV-based gene therapy has demonstrated durable responses for monogenic neuromuscular diseases following one-time treatment. Thank you, and I'm grateful to all the patients and their families who have participated in these trials, and I'm available for any questions related to gene therapy for neuromuscular disease.
Thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, my name is Sherry Wallach and I'm representing Novartis Gene Therapy Medical Affairs. A big thank you to Dr. Mandel for a wonderful presentation and for a great educational program. As a leader and a pioneer in the field of gene therapy um, it, that has done a tremendous amount of work, we are so honored to have Dr. Mandel here with us to answer questions from the participants. The first question is, what do you think are the biggest physician knowledge gaps relating to the clinical use of gene therapy? Yeah, I was a little surprised at the question. Um, it's an interesting one and one I hadn't anticipated, but I think that um, clinicians, as they speak to their uh, to prospective patients, if they come to them for advice, I think there is an anxiety about one, is it safe? And two, I think the other one um, that I hear from patients as feedback is that they want to know how long gene therapy persists. In other words, you go through all this, the expenses are very great, and is it worth the effort um, because of the potential duration? Well, we, I presented it in this, um, in, in this slide deck, but what we, we see is something that may be even more than we anticipated. In the SMA trial, we have data now out past six years. And in the Duchenne trial, we have patient uh, efficacy out to two years. And same in the LGMD trial. And over that time, we have continued improvement. So I would say the duration um, of one-time therapy is looking very good over the long run. Great. So we, are, we got a little, couple more questions. What do you see as the biggest barrier to access for patients of gene therapy? Um, again, I think that's an important question, but both, uh, both Novartis as the, as the industry partner for SMA and Serapta as the industry partner for, um, for the DMD and LGMD trials are working very hard to make gene therapy available in, um, in European countries and, and um, even in the Middle East. Um, there are um, approvals that are pending in those countries. There are uh, phase three trials that are moving there. And um, that's, so I think that will happen in a very short time. The other possibility that for our trials, we have patients who are um, who come from everywhere. I saw a patient this morning in follow-up in our gene therapy trial from Denmark. I've had patients coming from uh, uh, came from um, Romania um, earlier this week, and um, and we have patients coming from Spain. So they're really the barriers are not what you think they are in contacting our group. We use our global tra global uh, travel services to to interact with families, and we can screen them here. The biggest thing, as the PI on these studies, that concerns me is I hate for patients to travel such a long way and then be disappointed if they can't get into the trial meet elig meeting eligibility. So we try to contact the patients before and go over as many points as possible that would make them eligible and not uh, have a, um, an insignificant trip. The other thing that is kind of getting in the way, obviously, of long-term, of long-time uh, long, um, travel is uh, COVID. So yeah. we have to be particularly careful about that. But in, but in our hospital, for example, um, if medical eligibility is the is the single most driving force to get them here we can we can accomplish that so i wouldn't be reluctant to to uh, contact at least our center and we could we could put them in contact with other centers as well okay um here's another question thank you for for the presentation with sma we have a very good evidence already that treating pre-symptomatic infants is ideal do we know anything about the latest we can treat DMD and uh, expect optimal outcomes? 
Good question. Um, we have every reason to believe that we would see the same degree of efficacy in treating infants in, in newborn screens, for example, as we are in SMA. Um, we have very clear evidence that delivering the, the titers of virus, the amount of virus, the doses of virus that we're giving are actually safer in, uh, in younger infants than they are um, in, in older patients. So I have no concern about that. I think what you'll see very soon in what I hope in DMD is that our, our, our clinical findings at this point will drive approval for DMD gene therapy as soon as possible. And as soon as that happens, we'll have newborn screening that's approved um, in, in this country, in the US for DMD, and then we'll start treating uh, infants at that age. So um, the other possibility is that the, the, it'll be a clinical trial um, after uh, the, the four to seven year old uh, cohorts are completed and we'll be able to, to treat the young infants. But I think it's safe. Um, there's every reason to do it. I think you'll see the same outcomes we see in SMA. All right, so I'll take one more question. Um, did the gene therapy patients shown in the video receive any additional therapies following the one-time gene therapy treatment? Does it persist? Um, yeah, and I guess if, if those videos that you've shown, uh, did these kids uh, receive any additional I wish I could show you the videos therapies. I have from, from this morning. I have one patient at two years who um, is now essentially doing the same thing you would ask on the American Ninja Warrior. The, the child is uh, balancing on a beam. He is jumping from, uh, from um, one obstacle to another, and these obstacles are moving just like you see on the American Ninja Warrior. It's absolutely incredible and blew my mind. And what it meant was that over the two years, he um, has gradually caught up in developmental milestones to where he would be ordinarily. So we see continued improvement and um, I am giving a big presentation at the American Academy of Neurology in April. I'm gonna show you some of these additional uh, additional videos that I hope will convince you, but uh, trust me, they are there and they, and the treatment is, um, is incredibly beneficial. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandel. And um, thank you everyone for joining uh, the live session, answers for all the questions and uh, please stay safe and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.